Hey, welcome to another episode. We are going to talk about the very hot topic of when do I start to burn fat? Now, this isn't an easy answer, which is why I'm making an entire podcast about it. Um, but if you looked up, you know, if you Googled or, you know, put in a search about when do we start burning fat as human beings, you know, after we eat, you would probably get an answer like, oh, at about six to 12 hours, we start to burn fat, right? So this basically is answering when will I go into more of a fat burn after eating a meal? Now, this is kind of, you know, this is just a really standard answer. Like, okay, six to 12 hours. Do I start at six? Do I start at 12? <laughs> How much fat am I burning? Am I burning, you know, dietary fat that I ate that's in my bloodstream? Or am I actually burning stored body fat? And chances are, if you're listening to this, you are more interested in knowing when do you start to burn stored body fat, right? That's when weight loss occurs. That's when we're starting to heal disease processes and we're starting to burn out some of that fat around our organs. If we are very metabolically unhealthy, if we have um, fatty liver or PCOS, or we have um, type two diabetes or prediabetes, we have too much fat around our organs. So we start to burn that out. So you'd get a standard answer if you looked look that up, but it's just not that easy, right? With which, um, you know, goes along with so many questions that we have in nutrition and lifestyle and weight loss. Like there just isn't an easy answer. There isn't a one size fits all answer or approach for everyone. But what I want to do in this episode is kind of distinguish whether you're eating a low carb diet or a low carb approach. I hate the word diet. I like to say nutritional approach, but if I say diet, it just means, you know, the, the type of food that you're eating, um, your nutritional intake, it doesn't mean like a calorically restricted diet, which is what we all think of when we hear that word diet, but I kind of want to go over, you know, if you're eating a higher carb approach versus a lower carb approach and what can happen with fat burning and, you know, how a high carb approach can make it much more difficult to and prolonged to get into an actual fat burning state and to actually burn stored body fat, which is why I teach a low carb approach. It's not because, you know, carbs are inherently evil or bad. It's just that if we eat a really high carb approach or diet, it's really hard to burn fat because your body is going to burn carbohydrate if it is available. Um, so in reality, fat burning never stops. It's not like, you know, we eat and we eat a bunch of carbohydrates and we don't burn any fat. Like that's not true because our body can only burn so much carbohydrate at a time and it can easily convert extra carbohydrate to fat. So fat burning never stops. Um, but the question is, when does fat burning become the dominant fuel source for the body? You know, when, when are we going to run out of carb stores, run out of glycogen stores, which is the storage form of carbohydrate and actually move into body fat burning and stored fat burning. So typically our fat, like we like to, we hear all the time and it's just come, you know, like a, a common assumption that carbohydrates are the preferred fuel source. This actually isn't true. It's just because we eat in the Westernized culture, we eat such high carbohydrate intake that we're basically burning carbohydrate all the time. And so it's not the preferred fuel source. It's just the fuel source that we are utilizing most often because we take in so much carbohydrate, but at any given time, fat is used predominantly. So we're burning as humans about 50 to 95% of our fuel is coming from fat. We're burning fat. We're not burning carbohydrates all the time because like I say, we, our body can use a certain amount of carbohydrate and then it's going to convert that energy into fat. So carbohydrates can be converted into fat for energy, but fat cannot be converted into carbohydrates. Um, so make sure that that is straight in your brain. We can, you know, carbohydrates can be converted to fat. Fat cannot be converted to carbohydrate. 
um, glucose that we're, that, that we're taking in, that our body's utilizing is being used for fuel on average, anywhere from five to 50% of the time. So it's predominantly fat. Now, depending on how much carbohydrate you are eating, the activities that you're doing, um, many factors come into play here, but, um, you're utilizing glucose for fuel anywhere from five to 50%. So if you're eating more of a ketogenic or low carb approach, you're not going to be utilizing glucose as often, but if you're having, you know, eating a really high carb diet, you're going to be utilizing up to 50%, um, glucose for energy. And again, you can convert that carbohydrate to fats. So people think, well, how do I get fat if I don't eat any fat? It's like, well, your body will use what it needs. And above that, it converts carb to fat. So don't forget that. And then protein, your body doesn't like to use as an energy source. It's preferred fueling sources are fat first, then carbohydrate if it's available. And then protein, like pro the body doesn't like to use protein for energy. Protein is supposed to be utilized for building blocks, building hormones, building tissue, building muscle, building bone. That's what protein is utilized for. So that's why if you don't eat enough protein, you can become frail and you can have many issues. You can have hormonal issues that stem back to not eating enough protein, fatty acids as well. Many hormones are built from fatty acids in particular sex hormones, neurotransmitters, feel good hormones. Like if you don't eat enough fat and protein, you're not, you're not going to feel well and, and build, have the proper building blocks to build hormones, neurotransmitters, and all of the other things that are necessary in the body. Um, but if we look at our normal blood glucose in an, in a fasted state over about, you know, 12 hours or so, blood glucose on average is going to be somewhere between 80 and a hundred. So we'll just say that you have a, a blood glucose of 100. Now, what that means is you don't have that much carbohydrate floating around. It's only 100 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. So it's a pretty low amount of blood sugar. It only equates to about five grams of carbohydrate or one teaspoon of glucose. So we have give or take, I mean, it's going to, of course, depend on if you're male or female and your body size and all of that, but about one and a half gallons of blood circulating in our body at any given time. And if we only, if we have about hundred milligrams per deciliter of glucose circulating, that gives us about five grams of carbohydrate or one teaspoon of carbohydrate. Okay. That's like, like a neutral amount and what's average for humans. So what we've done, and we'll get to like, how do you know, how, how do I know I'm burning fat or where do I get the fat in a few minutes? But I want you to understand this because it puts it all into context and why so many people have trouble burning body fat ultimately. And it just seemed to gain weight, gain weight, no matter what they do, they're not eating fat. They're eating the standard high carb approach that they've been told to eat. They're eating lots of grains or eating lots of fruits and vegetables, um, lots of dairy, but they're still not losing weight. What the heck is going on here? So if we eat say, okay, we're going to, we're going to start with the typical, standardized conventional recommendations of high carbohydrate. So say you get up in the morning, we've been told that carbohydrates stabilize our energy and that we need carbohydrates, especially right when we get up in the morning in order to have stable energy throughout the day, you know, you're going to feel like absolute garbage if you don't eat eat a lot of carbohydrates. So say you have, you know, cereal with skim milk, because, you know, we don't want milk with fat in it. So we're going to have skim milk with, with cereal, even if it's a whole grain cereal, say we have, um, something like Cheerios, you know, that we've been told forever. That is, um, a good heart healthy cereal. I'm using air quotes, if you can see me. Um, but, but say we're eating Cheerios with skim milk, we're having some orange juice because we've been told, you know, orange juice is, is, um, good to take in, in the morning, good for our energy and a banana. We're told, you know, we got to eat our fruit in the morning. We got to stabilize our energy. We're having toast with peanut butter, something like that. 
you know, but that's pretty standard. So cereal, milk, toast with peanut butter, fruit, and some orange juice and a banana. So that equates to about 100 to 125 grams of carbohydrate. Remember, we only have about five grams of carbohydrate <laughs> circulating in our body when we get up in the morning. So now we eat this very, very high carb breakfast because we're, we've been told that that's what we should eat. And we have just given our body about, you know, if we, if we look at that as how much glucose is in the bloodstream, if we increase it by hundred to 125 grams of carbohydrate, we're increasing the load of glucose in our bloodstream by about 35 to 40 fold. That's insane when you think about it. Um, so this, we took in, in about 15 to 20 minutes, right? Cause we're really pressed for time in the morning. We're gobbling down our breakfast and out we go. So we have just loaded our body with 35 to 40 times the amount of carbohydrate that we were in, in a fasted state. Now, if our bodies weren't so genius and awesome, this would be an emergency every single day for our bodies. Um, because if we didn't have all of these, we'll call them safety mechanisms in place to deal with those high levels of carbohydrate, we would basically go into a coma and die every single day. And, you know, it's like, I laugh about that. It's not funny, but we, our body protects us from this, but it's crazy. Um, so if we had no insulin to counteract this and the other safety mechanisms that kind of counteract our, our blood sugar rising really high if we didn't have any of that, our blood sugar would go to 100 grams, 100 milligrams per deciliter to about 3,400 milligrams per deciliter, 3,400 milligrams per deciliter within an hour. If we didn't have these mechanisms in place. Um, so anything over about 600, a blood sugar of about 600. So 600 milligrams per deciliter was, is basically a, a, a coma and death. Like your body just cannot handle that amount of carbohydrate. Um, so we have all of these safety mechanisms. We have insulin. So when we take in a, a large amount of carbohydrates, um, it, and it doesn't even have to be for breakfast. It can be at any, you know, given time, but I'm just using that, um, that, that example, because that's what most people do we have a huge push of insulin. So insulin helps to push the energy into the cells. The problem is a lot of times our cells are already packed with energy. Um, so it helps to push the insulin in, in the energy into the cell. And another thing that insulin does is it basically um, shoves our body into a state of only using glucose as energy, right? Cause it's way high. So if we have high insulin levels, that insulin tells our body kind of puts the alarm bells out. Like don't let this person use any other source of energy because glucose is really high and we have to get rid of it. Right. So why would your body burn fat and go into fat burning mode? If insulin is really high and there's a ton of carbohydrates available, it's not going to, it's going to utilize the carbs first and the body's again, protecting you from those really high blood sugars. So it will increase insulin. It'll utilize some of that glucose for energy, right? Like when we're even just sitting and using brain power and that sort of thing, we can utilize energy for fuel. If we exercise that, of course, will burn off some of that energy as well. Um, so, so that is helpful if you do take in a, a big load of carbohydrates, so at least get some exercise and burn off some of that. So your body doesn't have to release so much insulin. But what does it do with anything that's left? Remember, we're we're talking about 3,400 milligrams per deciliter. We got to shove it into the cell. We got to utilize it. We got to burn it off with exercise. But if you're sedentary, you're not burning that. What does your body do with that? It converts it to fat. Okay, so, so too much carbohydrate, meal after meal after meal. People say, well, I don't eat fat. I don't understand why I'm storing fat when I don't eat fat. Well, you can't utilize all that carbohydrates. Your body has to do something with it to protect you from death, basically. So it's going to convert 
carbs to fat. Remember your body can convert carbs to fat, cannot convert fat to carb. All right. So those are all of the safety mechanism. And then the last thing that the body will do is spill. If the glucose gets really, really high, um, and the, this protective mechanism turns on at about, um, you know, if your blood sugar is one 180 milligrams per deciliter or more, it turns on the process of glucosuria, which is basically spilling glucose into the urine. The kidney just lets that glucose dump into the urine because it's too high. So that's where the excessive thirst can come in. If you have high blood sugars all the time and having to pee all the time, because your, your kidneys are one of the last protective mechanisms. If your blood sugar is rising above 180, then it starts to spill that glucose into the urine, um, in a, in a process called glucosuria. Um, so that, you know, again, it's protecting you. So that's one of those symptoms that I talk about all the time on Instagram and in the podcast is if you have excessive thirst and you are urinating all the time, that's, an, those are signs of high blood sugars because your body's trying to protect you. And that means your blood sugars are pretty dang high. Like you're, you know, that threshold is set at, at about 180. So your blood sugars are high and your body is trying to dump and get rid of those to protect you. Um, so when we go back to that whole notion of glucose being the preferred fuel, that's just simply not true. It's just, we have lived in such a culture of eating so many carbohydrates. Your body is basically forced to use those, um, you know, glucose for energy because it's always there. It's always available. And your body protects you from, you know, having high blood sugars, high blood sugars, are not good for the body. Anything over like 140 milligrams per deciliter can cause damage to the body. It causes damage to the blood vessels. Um, you know, you have unstable blood sugars when you have spikes and dips, when you have blood sugar spikes from eating a ton of carb, a big push of insulin, low blood sugars, you don't feel well, like your body screams at you and, you know, you get energy plunges. You want to take a nap, you get constant hunger. All of these symptoms are from wonky blood sugars and blood sugars being dysregulated throughout the day, which by the way, can all be fixed. Um, but you need to burn that fuel first for basically for your body to protect you. That doesn't mean it's the preferred fuel. It's just that if it's available, your body will burn it to protect you from high blood sugar levels. So I hope that that makes sense. And once you understand that concept, you can kind of get past the notion of I need carbohydrates in order to survive. And I need carbohydrates for fuel. No, your body just will burn them if they're there to keep your blood sugar regulated and stable. Um, so again, your body can only use, like, say we ate that really high carb meal, right. Of about a hundred to 125 grams of carbohydrate, which again, that's pretty, that's standard. Like I teach when I teach in my course, low carb approaches, I have you find somewhere between 25 to hundred grams of carbohydrate daily, depending on your goals, your health history, and you know, where you are right now. Um, but if we ate that really high carb breakfast, which I don't recommend any more than that many carbs over the whole entire day, but we're only going to use, like, if we just kind of sat and worked and we didn't do a lot of exercise or activity, we would be using about 50 calories an hour of that carbohydrate. That's not much, right? Like we just took in four or 125 grams of carbohydrate, we're only going to use about 50 calories per hour. So eating that high carb breakfast, it would take us about eight hours to completely get to the point where we've utilized all of those carbohydrates. And now our body is looking for a different source of fuel. How many of you eat a high carb breakfast like that and wait eight hours to eat again? Like hardly anybody because you're going to be super hungry from eating all those carbohydrates. So it just doesn't happen. So what happens? We eat a high carb breakfast, two, three hours later, our blood sugar dips from that huge push of insulin and we're hungry again. So the whole cycle just continues on and on 
throughout the day. So if we're not burning it, then we're going to store it, right? We're going to store it first as glycogen. Now, glycogen is the storage form of carbohydrates. You only have a finite amount of glycogen storage in the body. Um, you store some in your liver and you store some in your muscle tissues to use for energy later when you don't have a lot of energy coming in, but you can't store a lot of glycogen. It's about a day's worth of calories, give or take. Um, males can store a little bit more than females, about anywhere from 1600 to 2000 calories worth of glycogen. Females are more like 1200 to 1600 calories worth of glycogen. Again, stored in the liver, stored in the muscle tissues. So then if you are having to, you know, do a lot of exercise or you're not taking in a lot of food, your body will use those glycogen stores and convert that back to glucose. Um, but it's a finite amount. And if you're eating carbohydrates all the time and never burning out that glycogen, you're not depleting your glycogen stores over the course of the day. So even though you might have 1600 calories worth of glycogen storage in your body, they're always full because you're always eating carbohydrates and you're not burning it off. So maybe you only can store two to 300 grams of um, glycogen that in any one given day, because you're just not letting your body burn it out. I hope that that makes sense. So if you deplete your glycogen stores over the course of the day, by not eating a ton, by not eating, you know, I shouldn't say not eating a ton, not eating very often and not eating a lot of carbohydrates, you have more potential to store carbohydrates because they're those glycogen. They're like the little buckets around your body are empty. But if you're always eating carbohydrates, those buckets are always full. So you can't just keep stuffing more and more glucose into the cells. Like they get full. And then what happens is your body converts it to fat. So um, a lot of whether or not, you know, you are burning body fat and or burning fat that you're eating versus body fat really depends on, on carbohydrate intake. Right. Um, and that's why we teach a low carb approach and that's why it works so well to get into fat burning. Now fat is actually the preferred fuel for humans. I know you're probably thinking really Shanna, did you really just say that? But if you look back a hundred, 200 years ago, we did not eat any, you know, we did not eat like we do now. We did not have all of these ultra processed foods. We did not have all these carbohydrates available to us all of the time. We ate primarily protein and fat and a little bit of carbohydrate. So fat fuel is clean. It's the preferred fuel. It's a stable fuel. Burning fat doesn't require insulin, right? I mean, you, fat is fat. Like your body's gonna, you know, fat is doesn't have to convert it to anything. So it's this nice, clean, long burning fuel. There's no glucose. There's no insulin. It's already fat. Your your body likes it. Your body can store it as fat. It can, um, you know, retrieve those stores as fat in the form of triglycerides and fatty acids. Um, so to re it's, it's a lot easier for your body to just say, Oh, you know, that stored fat, I just need to basically change that, you know, change it into some fatty acids, dump it in the bloodstream and I can burn that. Whereas glucose needs to be converted. And, um, it's, it's more of a, a complex process for your body rather than the fat. So protein, again, we don't want to use protein for fuel, right? Like your body will only use protein for fuel if fat and carbohydrates are not available. It will, it will burn stored body fat before protein. I mean, if there's some protein circulating in the bloodstream, it might burn that a little bit, but the purpose of protein is not for fuel. Your fuel sources are fat and carbohydrates. Um, so protein is for building material, but in the case of fasting, and we'll get to, you know, more on, you know, a little bit longer fasts in a few minutes here, but 
during fasting, your body increases human growth hormone and it increases it by a lot. Like if we're over a 24 hour fast, if we're moving into like the 36 to 42 hour therapeutic fasting range that I talk about a lot with my students. And I've done a lot of podcasts on this, on that amount of fasting as well. Human growth hormone goes up by like 500 to 800%. It's a protective mechanism to force you to burn fat and to burn and for your body to retrieve its body fat stored, stored body fat. Okay. So that's the difference between fasting and calorie deprivation is during the fast, our human growth hormone increases so much that our body has to go looking for stored body fat. Um, so again, let's look at fasting, like what happens during fasting, what happens, um, you know, or we'll look at the fed state versus the fasted state. So that is what we kind of have to think about when we're looking at, well, when am I going to actually burn fat? Because if you're, if you're eating constantly and you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, there's no, there's no reason for your body to go looking for stored body fat. Cause it's always got carbohydrate available. It's always got glycogen in the cells. Um, so even if you're overnight, usually it takes a while to burn through those glycogen stores, unless you're doing a lot of heavy exercise. So if you're sedentary, you're eating a lot of carbohydrate, you're eating all the time, your insulin is high. It's nearly impossible for you to burn fat. So I teach all of these things inside low insulin Academy, all these strategies to, help you to get to burning fat. Like that is, that is one of your primary goals. Um, so the body in a fed state, in a fed state of high carbohydrates, you'll use about 50% carbohydrates and 50% fat. It, and again, it, the glucose use is going to depend on how much glycogen you have available and how much carbohydrate that you've eaten. So in the fed state, like, you know, this is, only about, you know, six hours out or so somewhere in there, you're using about 50, 50. Um, because even if you've eaten primarily carbohydrate, your body will again, protect you from those high blood sugar levels and convert it to fat. So we're, we're utilizing both carb and fat. Now, once we've moved through about six to 12 hours after our after our last meal, six to 12 hours, somewhere in there, that's when we start to transition into utilizing glycogen for fuel. So that would be like an over, you know, sleeping overnight. Um, if you stop eating around dinner time and you're in, you know, at six, 6 PM and now at 6 AM, you're utilizing glycogen by that time. Um, so now we're starting to decrease our carb burning a little bit and increasing our fat burning. Gradually, we're going to burn more and more fat if we're not eating, right? Because we only have so much stored carbohydrates. So we got to kind of burn through that. And that's about 12 to 16 hours or so where you're utilizing a lot of glycogen stores. Um, now that is if you're high carb, right? Like you're, ha you're taking in two to 400 grams of carbohydrate throughout the course of the day. Um, it's going to take at least 16 hours, 12 to 16 hours to burn through all of the food that you've eaten and all of the glycogen stores. Now, if you, if you eat low carb, we don't have the glycogen stores available right off the bat. And we don't have the carbohydrates the carb, as many circulating carbohydrates. So we're going to burn more, more fat right off the bat in a fad state. Now, whether or not that's stored body fat or that's fat that you've eaten kind of depends on the length of your fast. Um, but when we eat low carb, we're going to be burning fat a lot more often, um, which is a cleaner fuel. And that helps with hunger and satiety. So even if you're, you know, following a ketogenic approach or a lower carb approach, and you're not losing a ton of weight, you probably 
regardless of the weight that you're losing, you're still going to be able to burn fat more efficiently. You're going to be able to go longer periods of time without eating. You're going to have more stable energy um, because you're primarily burning fat for fuel. So in a fat state, you're already burning more fat than carbohydrates when you're on a low carb approach. Um, when you get to the glycogen stores, which is about, you know, 12 to 16 hours after you've last eaten, you will start to increase fat burning even more and then slightly lower carbohydrate that you're burning. So the question is then, well, when do I switch from burning body fat or from burning fat that I've eaten to body fat. Um, and that again is going to depend on a lot of, of different things. So, um, here's again, if you're eating a low carb approach, you're going to be able to go longer periods of time without eating. You're going to be eating fewer meals. You're not going to have the blood sugar swings. You're not going to have the big insulin pushes. So over time, even just switching to a lower carb approach first for a while can help you to get more into, you know, the, the metabolic flexibility and burning fat more often, fat adapted, decreasing hunger so that you are able to start fasting longer periods of time. So this is exactly how my, um, low insulin Academy works. I have people, you know, get the junk out of their diet and start to just slowly decrease carbohydrates over time <clears throat> so that you can get used to fat as a fuel source. And then once the fat is, once you're burning fat more efficiently and more metabolically flexible, you're just not as hungry, your insulin starts to come down and then you can incorporate, um, those fats. So where most people are going to be pretty fully transitioned into fat burning are those therapeutic fasting zones that I talk about. So insulin gets pretty low around hour 20 of a fast. So, um, you know, a couple 20 to 24 hour fast weekly can be very helpful to get you into fat burning, but those fasts, those therapeutic fasts of 36 to 42 hours of fasting, even 24 to 36 hours, like going overnight without food, that can really get you over the hump and burning your own stored body fat. People don't often like to hear this, <laughs> but even if you're ketogenic and you're eating, you know, protein and fat every single day and you're eating enough or that your body just is burning that fat for fuel, it it's not being forced to go look for fat that is stored. So that's where the, the longer therapeutic fasts really come into play, but they become much easier once you're metabolically flexible. Um, so I'm talking about fasting of at least 24 to 36 hours. We're kind of through the fed state. We're not in a fed state anymore, right? We're burned through that, like those glycogen stores. We've, we've mainly burned those out for most people, unless you are really, really high carb person. And it's taking longer to burn through those glycogen stores. But if you followed a low carb approach by 24 to 36 hours, you should be through those glycogen stores as well. And now we're in a, we're in a state of nice, steady blood sugar because your body knows how to utilize body fat and, and, um, you know, keep those blood sugars nice and low. So at this point, you know, we're only burning about 5% of our calories from fat and you might, or from carbohydrates. And you might say, well, I thought I was through all of those glycogen stores and your body can actually make glucose from protein. It doesn't like to but it will make uh, glucose from protein. Cause there are a couple of cells like red blood cells that have to use glucose for energy, um, but it can also make glucose from glycerol, which is a fatty acid. So it can manufacture, it won't do this a lot, you know, only what's essential, but it will manufacture glucose from glycerol as well. So by this point, the, the 24 to 36 hours past eating, we're at about 95% burning body fat. Um, so there's no food coming in. The glucose is, is made with gluconeogenesis or from glycerol, and you are now in fat burning land. <laughs> so this is why when people come to me and they're like, 
I've been fasting for 16 to 18 hours for months and I'm not losing any weight. Well, you have to look at, you know, what you're doing, what your body's doing metabolically and sometimes getting over a threshold, or if you've been really, really insulin resistant, some longer fasts are going to be required for your body to get forced into, you know, really low levels of insulin and fat burning to just kind of get you over that hump. And remember, we're going to spare our muscle mass during longer fast because that horm human growth hormone um, has really increased. So you might say, okay, well, I I'm doing these longer fasts. Is it all coming from my belly? Like, can, can I target spot, you know, spot or target where the body fat is coming from? Like how come, you know, my body fat comes off from my hips, but my friends comes off their arms and um, you can't like regulate where you're going to burn your body fat, right? Your body fat's going to dump fatty acids from all over the place when it needs them. So it's not like you can say, okay, body tonight, I want you to take two pounds or this week, you know, during my longer fast, I want you to take a pound from my liver fat. You know, it's like your body doesn't do that. Yes. It's going to, um, probably burn out the fat around your organs first, because that is really harmful fat and your body knows that. Um, but you can't say, Oh, I want, I want to burn my arm fat. I mean, you can definitely, uh, make, you know, tone that with strength training, but your body will lose body fat from all over. But I have done, um, a podcast about this with belly fat and decreasing where it's deposited in the first place. Like you can decrease, um, the chances that, excuse me, that your body fat is deposited around the belly area by decreasing cortisol levels and decreasing insulin levels. Those two hormones, high cortisol, high insulin, definitely increase your propensity to store belly fat. Um, so again, we need to tackle, you know, if, if we have a lot of fat around the belly, we need to look at keeping our cortisol levels low and, and keeping our insulin levels low. So the insulin helps to move glucose into the cell. Um, and it also turns off all, you know, it prevents the body from using all other fuels to again, protect you. Um, Insulin also promotes lipogenesis, which is the creation of new fat. Okay. For all the reasons I already said. So if you want to stop storing body fat, you've got to get a handle on your insulin levels and start to reverse insulin resistance. And again, this is all taught in my course, low insulin Academy. Um, that's why I named it low insulin Academy so that you can you know, over the course of the day, learn many, many strategies to lower insulin levels over time. It doesn't happen overnight, but it will happen in time. Um, insulin also blocks the breaking down of fat. So if insulin is high, it's just pretty much impossible to burn fat. And if you are severely insulin resistant, which a lot of my students are, if you are pre-diabetic or type two diabetic, or you have fatty liver, you are probably very insulin resistant. Your body will resist fat burning even more and really fight to keep the fat in the stores because the hormone is so dysregulated. It also will help you or it will drive your hunger. So if you have really high insulin levels, your body's not good at burning fat, right? So it's going to want to burn carbohydrates and it's going to send out all these signals, hunger, cravings. I need carbs right now because I can't burn body fat. So it's, it's a complex situation and it's really tricky and you need to work with a professional if if this is you, because it's really hard, you don't want to just, you know, start throwing these 20 hour fast and go from eating 300 carbohydrates a day to 50 grams of carbohydrate the next day, throw in these 20 hour fasts. Like you are going to be very miserable. If you do that, <clears throat> you need to work with a professional such as myself and roll yourself in a course that teaches you all the strategies to slowly bring your insulin levels down so that you can start to burn your own body fat and be metabolically flexible. It's just, it's, it's so 
frustrating for people and students who have high insulin, because like I said, they're, um, you know, they're wanting to lose weight. They're wanting to be healthier, but their body is sending all these signals to eat a ton of carbohydrates, to eat sugar. And, um, you know, it's really hard to do any fasting when you have high insulin because your body is not cooperating with you. So as your insulin comes down and you get more fat adapted, this does take time. It's about a four to six week, you know, kind of transition. <clears throat> That's why I teach my students to do this slowly so that you're, you know, it's, it's a lot easier that way. You gain control over your appetite. Okay. It will happen. And all of a sudden you're not thinking about food all the time. You're not thinking about sugar all the time. You eat a meal that is filling and satiating and you're like, Oh, it's been five hours. And I'm, you know, I'm not thinking about food. I'm not so hungry. Um, but it will happen. So again, going back to fat burning, like when am I going to burn the, my stored body fat? Like sometimes those longer fasts are really what is necessary to break through plateaus. And I have, you know, I've worked with thousands of students at this point. And sometimes I have students who do 15 to 18 hours of fasting, do great. They see a lot of progress. They meet their goals. And then there are some who do 15 to 18 hours of fasting. And that works very well as a maintenance protocol for them, but they do not see weight loss. And that's where those longer fasts are key and other strategies to bring down insulin enough so that your body says, oh, I don't need carbohydrates all the time. I do have stored body fat. Um, but if your insulin levels are high, that that is um, that is a hard process to, um, you know, it's hard for your body to do that right off the bat. So again, so when does fat burning start? I mean, it, it really just depends on, again, like we need to, to look at the whole picture. We need to look at how many carbohydrates are we taking in? If you're taking in 300 grams of carbohydrate versus 100 grams of carbohydrate, that makes things, it's a completely different playing field. If you're eating a really high carb diet all the time, always carbs in the bloodstream, you're going to burn those all, all day. You're, you're essentially never going to get to fat burning and you're essentially never going to get to burning your stored body fat. Now, if you're eating about hundred grams of carbohydrate, your strength training, um, you're getting some exercise after your meal. So you're not, you know, you're not soaking up all of the glucose that you ate. Um, and you're doing, you know, other things to help keep the, the insulin low, keep the carbohydrate low, it's going to be completely different for you. You have to look at your glycogen stores. Are they full? Are they empty? If they're full, you got to burn through those before you're going to burn stored body fat, right? If they're empty because you don't eat a lot of carbohydrate or you did some, a good amount of exercise, you get to fat burning much more quickly. So it's not like we can point and say, okay, within eight hours, you're you're now, you know, burning fat within 16 hours, you're burning all stored body fat. Like it really, there's a lot of factors involved. And then of course, if you are trying to lose weight, calorie deficit does come into play. I don't like to teach calorie counting uh, hormones really dictate what your body does with with energy and fuel, but those longer fasts do create a calorie deficit and it keeps your insulin levels low enough for you to burn your own body fat. So that does come into play, but transitioning to a lower carb or ketogenic approach is going to help you to control your hunger because you're burning body fat. You're not reliant on carbohydrate and it really doesn't even feel like you're in a calorie deficit because your body's easily able to transition to, um, um, util utilizing fat for fuel and utilizing body fat for fuel. So, you know, that also will help you to stabilize blood sugars, all the things, you know, I teach all of these things in my course. There's a lot of tricks to stabilizing blood sugars. There's meal order, there's macronutrients, there's timing of the meals. All of that comes into play to help stabilize blood sugars. I have, just a whole masterclass devoted to this that I will link in the show notes. It's 10 hacks to stabilize blood sugar and keep your energy levels up. <clears throat> and then of course that, that 
masterclass is inside Low Insulin Academy that has over 37 pre-recorded lessons for you to go through on your own self-paced. Um, you can do the on-demand version where you could go and get that right now. <laughs> Click the, the link in the show notes and go get the on-demand version. All 37 lessons, you go through them self-paced on your own time. You have lifetime access to those. Or you can do the next live version. And at the time of this recording, the next live version is September of 2023. I run those about three times a year. It's the same curriculum, the same lessons. I just take you through the course with me. And I provide you with eight weeks of group coaching weekly. So weekly group coaching sessions along with the course. And the enrollment opens for that in early September, excuse me, you can get on the wait list for that um, so that you can be sure to get into the next session. Um, so overall, you know, all of the things that, that I teach inside Low Insulin Academy are going to help you to, you know, ultimately reverse your chronic disease and let your body get into fat burning so that you can stabilize your body weight. And no matter what approach you're following. We should always eat real food. These ultra processed foods really jack up our blood sugars. They really, you know, spike our blood sugars so much. Um, what if, if they're full of wheat and sugar and fake foods, and then we get huge pushes of insulin and insulin's high, and it's really hard to overcome insulin resistance. We do definitely have to eat real food. And then along with those longer fasts, um, you know, nourishing properly in between your fasts, knowing that hunger is a habit. So if you're eating at the same exact time every day, you're going to get hungry around that same exact time, you know, keeping busy throughout those longer fasts and really focusing on taking in electrolytes with your fasting time so that, um, you have better outcomes with your fasting, because just because you drink water doesn't mean that you're going to retain the fluid. You need the electrolytes there. You need the electrolytes to retain the, the fluid. And if we are lowering our insulin levels, which is what we want to do, but as insulin levels fall, you flush water. And then with that water goes electrolytes. So you need to replenish those. So I have a link in the show notes for element L M N T that you can order. Um, there's lots of different flavors. That's a, a great electrolyte mix. I also like Redmond's relight. And then I've been, I am trying out a couple of other alternatives, um, from different companies who have asked me to um, try their electrolyte mixes as well. And I will keep you updated on all of that. But hopefully that helps clear up. You're like, when the heck am I going to actually burn my own body fat? And it just helps you to understand the physiology behind it. Like it's not just your body being stubborn. It's a process. And if you have high insulin levels and insulin resistance, it's definitely more challenging. So if this podcast helped you, this episode helped you, please grab the link and share it with a friend. Um, that really, really helps to get the podcast into in front of more people. So grab the, the share link, share it with a friend, share it on your social media. I'd love if you tag me, I will reshare that to my social media as well. Um, share it with a friend. And then if you leave um, on Apple iTunes, if you want to leave a rating and review, make sure to screenshot it. So I know that you left a rating and review, email it to me. And then um, I will give you a free download of either my Fast to Heal recipe book or my Fast to Heal companion workbook to my book, Fast to Heal. Hope you learned a lot in this week's episode. I'll see you back next week for another episode.